the show. You're welcome. It's great to be here. Amazing. So, Sue, tell me, how did growing up in a pub in England impact how you came to view relationships? Ah, well, um, it's a bit unusual for a child um, uh, to be standing on a stool. Uh, you know, I was always given little tasks. That was just the culture I was in. So, it, uh, you know, I was given a stool to stand on and I was supposed to lift the dirty glasses from the sink and dry them and put them on the shelf. But the thing with that is, when you're a kid, you know, that you sort of do that in about two, you watch. So I spent my childhood, instead of the things that kids usually do, um, you know, play cowboys and Indians or something, I spent my childhood watching people interact, watching uh, and sometimes inebriated people. So you've got a huge range. You know, first of all, I wasn't afraid of emotion and, and strong emotion because it was just an everyday part of my existence, you know. And I saw that it people lost their cool and then they came back again. And and sometimes they didn't come back. And my dad had to go around and these huge hands would come down from heaven and grab the person that was being <laughs> obstreperous, right? And sort of escort them out of the pub. But uh, I like that bit. But I watched people, I mean, I didn't understand it as a child. I watched people flirt and fight and i watched people sit and cry into their beer as my dad um, talked to them in a quiet voice i mean it was very good training for um, clinical work it was you know and there was an enormous community in that pub english local english pubs um are really i hear they're all closing now which makes my heart sad but um, they were community centers, you know, elderly people would come in and sit in the same seat and drink their little sherry. It took them three hours to drink their little sherry. Well, of course it did, because everybody talked to them and joked with them and asked them how they were. People would come in who were grieving. People would come in sad. People would come in angry. People would come in to flirt. And I watched it all. And I think um, it taught me how to step back and look at patterns in the way people dance together, the way they interact. It taught me to be comfortable with all kinds of different kinds of mu emotional music. And so when I started seeing uh, couples in particular, which was very overwhelming for me because I felt like uh, there was nothing in my training to prepare me at all for working, the intensity of working with a distressed couple. And what I, nobody really understood, you know, how come they were so distressed and, and what was going on here? When I started, it was like, no, somebody give me some help here. No, you know, couples therapy just started with distressed people going along and saying, help me. It wasn't like everyone's, nobody, people sat down and studied couples first. They didn't, that only happened in the last 20 years. So. Um, I was completely confused and I think I fell back on what I knew, which is uh, what's happening here? How are these two people dancing together? How, how are they keeping the dance going? Oh, it's something to do with the emotional signals they send each other. And you know, I wasn't intimidated by the emotion. So I would naturally say to myself, um, how come that guy's so upset? You know, what happened in the second before his face changed and his voice went high and his body got, you know, his shoulders got bigger. You know, I would ask myself questions like that, whereas maybe other people wouldn't. I don't know. But for me, um, and also I, I was just fascinated because I was fascinated as a child. You know, the drama of it all. <laughs> You know, my mother, you know, a guy would start crying and he'd say the same thing to my dad every night. I remember this one guy, same thing to my dad every night. And I, and I, even as a child, I thought, this is funny because this man comes and he says the same thing to my dad every night. And my dad says the same thing back to him and gives him, and gives him a scotch, right? And so why does he come in and keep doing this? And it became obvious to me that, 
this wasn't about the content of the fight lots of times. It was about things like comfort. It was about just the people being together. It was about, it was about the fact that he came in because when my dad talked to him, um, he came in at the beginning of the evening when there was no one around. My dad would, and I would watch, my dad would drop his voice. My dad would lean across the bar. My dad would put his hand on his arm. Right. And then, of course, my dad would say, have another scotch. <laughs> 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 because, you know, he was a public, he was selling booze. But it, and um, there were people around all the time. I grew up in a sea of people. My granny, you know, we have very strange images of older people these days, I think. I grew up with a grandmother who was uh, about half my size, and I'm pretty small, uh, fiery, um, I like to drink a lot, a lot of scotch. <laughs> um, I like the wrestling, like to watch the wrestling on TV, you know, um, full of life and telling jokes and playing the piano very badly in the bar. I must admit she was pretty bad, but nobody seemed to mind how bad she was. So I grew up in this sea of people. So I, I learned to be curious about people. I learned that listening to the content of the, of the conversation or wasn't always what was going on. There were different levels to a conversation. I learned to be tolerant of emotion. Actually, it was incredible training. It was incredible training for being a psychologist and for working with relationships because that pub was all about relationships. And mostly what the booze did was it, it sort of let people relax and disinhibited people, you know, so that they would say things to the, my dad or to each other in the pub that they wouldn't say regularly. And people would come in every day. They weren't coming in for the booze. They were coming in for the social interaction. And that's important these days because now we have one epidemic happening in the world, but we forget that we have another epidemic happening in the world and it's just as serious. And that's, we have an epidemic of loneliness. And if you have an epidemic of loneliness, you're gonna have rising, rising, rising rates of depression and anxiety. That's just the way it is. And no government, no health system is going to cure that. We have to look at um, how we live and how we connect with each other and how we don't connect with each other and how that fits with who we are as human beings, which, which is, it doesn't. I love that, I love that. And it's just so interesting, you mentioned a few stages of your life, because when I was going through the book, it seemed as if uh, Balby had a major impact on your life in terms of his findings. And also it seemed like your parents, and in particular them splitting up, even though they had you know, a lot of love for, you, for each other. But you mentioned in the book that, I mean, your dad was weeping for your mother on his death at 20 years after they'd split up. So it seems yeah. like from, from, you know, from that level, you've been introduced so heavily to human nature and relationships. Yes. Yes. And I was also introduced to the fact that um, there's more than one reality and you have to tune into different realities because, you know, I was a little working class girl in a pub imagine and then imagine for some reason i'm not quite clear about and i don't know how it happened because we certainly couldn't afford it i ended up going at four years old which is way too young right four years old going every day to a very sort of upper class roman catholic school i wasn't roman i was the only working class kid the only protestant kid i didn't go to mass you know, I, I didn't know the Latin hymns. You know, I, I didn't dress the same. I didn't speak the same. I spoke in a Cockney accent, right? And, and why, I mean, talk about um, drop your kid into a place where they're gonna be an outsider. But imagine the difference in the world. You know, I went into this big old house. There were all these women in black. You know, they were all, they were all talking about martyrs martyrdom and how martyrdom I thought <laughs> I, they were all talking about you know sin and purgatory and we had to well, they gave me an amazing education you know they would make you think and boy those nuns were fierce you did your homework okay or you were going to go to hell I mean there was like you just did it 
And so it was in that for half the time. And then I go uh, to the pub, you know, imagine, I mean, even as a child, you knew there's more than one reality. <laughs> there's, more than, there's more than one way of seeing things here on this planet because because you know these two aren't, and I would get into lots of trouble. You know, I I remember being um, I remember being um, taken to the priest who just died's grave site by the nun with the other kids, and we we're all supposed to say a prayer for Father, whatever his name was. She said the Holy Father died of a heart attack because he was so loving, and of course me, stupid, right? I said. No, he didn't. He died of something called sclerosis of the liver from drinking too much booze in my dad's pub. Well, in, in, imagine how that went down, right? Like, I, like um, so I had a strange childhood. Um, it was an intense childhood and it was full of um, dramas and emotions. And, you know, it wasn't that long. I mean, it was some years, I guess, but all I can say is the war, the, the war was still very present in my childhood because everybody in my hometown had been in the Navy. It was a naval town. So everybody, uh, every man in that town had been in submarines, had been in the dockyard building ships, had been on destroyers. And, you know, um, so I was used to these big tough men walking with my father, you know, big tough men, walking with them down the street, and suddenly they'd see somebody and burst into tears, you know, um, and hug each other and hold each other like they were, you know, they, they were life brothers, because they were life brothers. Because the last time they saw this man, they thought he was gonna die, you know, he'd been wounded in a submarine, right? And so I was used to the idea that we can do lots of things with our feelings, but we have them whether we like them or not. And um, that we're all human beings. And, you know, whether you, how, no matter how you're taught to deal with your feelings, they're there. And that they have a regularity to them, they have a pattern. Even I knew that as a child. I thought, well, why do people say these emotions are not rational? They, say, they make sense to me. You know, my daddy cries because he was he was in the war with these men and they were scared and they lost people. And it was it was a very bad time, you know, and you knew that. And I watch men with what I know now was PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I watched guys have freakouts. One gentleman in particular, he had a plate in his head or something from an injury and he wasn't supposed to drink. He would come in the pub for, for uh, companionship, right? He lived alone. And, and of course, sometimes he did drink. And then he'd lose it, you know. And so I think I got very used to human interactions and human responses. And they seemed to make sense to me. And they, the patterns made sense. So then when I started seeing couples, that helped me a lot. Because for sure, the books didn't help me. My training didn't help me. Um, you know, on, in the library, um, you know, the, the, the whole culture back then was, well, love's a mystery. It's about sex and sentiment. Nobody really understands it. You fall in, you fall out. It's got a best before date. You know, nobody really understands about couples. So you just get together with them and you just try to stop them fighting. And I knew right off the bat with the couples I saw, that wasn't gonna work because the emotions that were pushing this dance that they were caught in were powerful, powerful. And it was no point just sitting, pointing out, you know, that they were being mean to each other or, and then suggesting exercise. I remember going in a class and the professor saying, well, what you do is you, you basically teach them to be nice to each other, you know, and even, and, and right then I thought, well, that's not going to work. That, is that all you've, is that all you've got? That's all you've got. And then I, I went to all the books and I thought, yeah, that is all they've got. Oh, well then I'm 
stuck because I got all these couples, right? And so then I did, thank God, you know, you make some decisions. I started taping my couples, you know, um, and audio taping them and sometimes video taping them. It was all pretty primitive back then. And they let me do it because they trusted me. And I started watching my sessions again and again and again. I'd watch sessions 10 times. And then I read John Bowlby. And John Bowlby really only had time in his lifetime to write about the bond between mother and child. But by the, but, and this was before anyone had, had really related it to adults, right? Um, so I, I, but I looked at, I read John Bowlby and I, I looked at my couples, I thought, this is the same. This dance is the same. It's, of course, it's not the same because the baby's incredibly dependent and these, you know, and the mother has to take care of the baby, but it's the same. You know, they gaze at each other. They, they send powerful emotions to each other. They, they need this connection. They, you know, the emotions look the same. And, it, and that started to just, um, I don't know what the word is. I can never come up with a word in interviews. It completely enthralled me. It completely grabbed me. And um, before I knew where I was, I was starting writing articles, very unpopular ones, I might add. <laughs> I got a job as a, I did a big study and we, I found out that I put together a manual and I persuaded some other crazy therapists to try it out with me. And we got these amazing results and I got a professorship. And then um, at the University of Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada, and I just, I just became uh, absorbed and enthralled and seeing couples and doing studies. And then, and I'm glad, I was very proud to be part of this, um, other people, developmental psychologists, social psychologists, and me talking about couples, the couples I saw, because I was with these people all the time in the middle of this dance, and I was figuring out how to change the dance. And we started to realize you could change the dance. The dance had a structure to it. Your know, emotions have a structure to them. The, the relationships have a structure. And if you know the key, the key variables, the key things that are driving everything, the key organizing factors and start to change those, you change, you can change a living system like a relationship. So, and then, um, adult bonding, the whole study of adult bonding took off. And I'm very proud to say that we were part of that. And in the last 20 years, um, and, and this is why I talk to people like you, instead of going out and work in my garden or, or walk my dogs, okay? I talk to people like you because the public needs to know that we now have for the last 20 years, a science of love and bonding, a science of romantic love and bonding, a science of partnership. And we know that these powerful dances we engage in with the people we depend on and love impact the way we see ourselves, the way we, um, our emotional landscape, the way our nervous system responds to stress. Um, we know this, we know, and, and we have learned so much about love and love is not about sex and sentiment. Yeah, that's part of it. But love is an ancient wired in survival code designed to keep a few people on this planet that you know will come when you call, that you can count on close to you. When you have those people close to you, and this is why love is so intoxicating, when you have those people close to you, uh, between mother and child, father and child, siblings perhaps, lifelong friends, certainly adult lovers or life partners. When you have those people close to you, that's a safety cue for your nervous system. You don't have to be vigilant for danger in the same way. You can share the load of, of stress and anxiety in life. You, it frees you up, literally. When, when someone has your back and you're standing beside someone, you can, I'm going on a big broad level here, but you can literally adapt to life and grow and change and sort of expand as a person and find your strength. You, ironically, the more connected you are with a few people that you really can trust and confide in, 
the more connected, securely connected you are, the more separate and yourself and different and complete you can be. So this is important stuff. We, we understand relationships. We understand what goes wrong. And we understand how to put it right. My lab, we are way ahead, oh, heads and tails above anyone else in the couples field. We have 20 outcome studies, they're all positive. Our results last over years. Um, we can show people, we don't only just make people more satisfied in their relationship, we actually change their bonding. We change how they bond with each other. We change love. And so this, so much has happened in the last 20 years. So much has happened. It's so important to us, to our health, to how we live our lives, to how we see ourselves. And um, most of the world doesn't know about, it. you know, I said to a woman in the New York Times, uh, well, I was, I worked with the military in the US for a while. And at one point we were all over one part of the New York Times. And I said, it's nice. But you know, um, why do you put all this stuff on the front page? They would put on the front page, couples therapy doesn't work, right? Okay, a lot of it doesn't because people aren't using this new science, right? So, um, so I said, that's real negative. That really um, discourages people, tells people that relationships are impossible, monogamy is impossible, you know, love's impossible. That's not what people need to hear. Why don't you put splash all over the front of the New York Times? We've cracked the code of love. Psychologists have cracked the code of love and we know what goes wrong and we know how to fix it. And here's what we can do to have these amazing relationships that grow us as human beings and help us have better societies, be better parents. Why don't you put that all over the front of the New York Times? And I'll never forget it. This is why it's that she said, long pause. And then she said, well, bad news is always more interesting, first of all, which made me mad, okay? <laughs> and then she said, and anyway, people just think that's common sense. I said, common sense? <laughs> I said, listen, this whole science of bonding has changed how we see children, changed how we parent our children, radically it's created a revolution in how we parent our kids bonding science in the last 50 years and now it can do the same for adult love relationships put it on the front of your newspaper you know, it's, i don't need to be on the front of your newspaper put my other i don't care if i'm there put it on the front of your newspaper no they put i don't know what they put what do they put on the front of their newspaper uh you know it's um so so many people don't know about this and you know it's urgent i'm a psychologist i look at mental health how people deal with this present crisis how people deal with crises in, the, in their lives what i see is that emotional isolation we're talking about social distancing but you know we just have a little taste of emotional isolation emotional isolation destroys us as human beings we're not wired for it we can't cope with it our nervous system isn't isn't designed for it right and um you know it's like contact a special kind of contact close contact with others and belonging to a social group where you feel like you matter to other people those are as important to us as oxygen they're as important in our in our mental health and physical health as oxygen and so for me, this is like urgent stuff. We need, everyone needs to know about this. We need to, I uh, wrote to the um, government here in British Columbia, the province of British Columbia, and told them, you know, in the last 30 years, we've done a lot. We've created educational programs based on the book that you like, Hold Me Tight. Amazing we've book. even created an online, we've put it online, holdmetightonline.com. So I wrote to the premier of the province and said, listen, um, grab this, make it available to people. We'll, we'll reduce the price to almost nothing. Just do it. I've never got a letter back <laughs> because, you know, 
written, I, re I wrote, I didn't just say that, I wrote a pretty sophisticated letter actually, okay, and said, here's how to do it and it won't even cost you, it'll cost you peanuts, it's so cheap, you know, educate people about relationships, especially now because now in this pandemic, we know on a level that we aren't usually aware of that our lives are in other people's hands and that we need each other. So while we are aware of that, here, you know, give people this educational tool. And I guess it's, it, you know, society's a big ship and it takes a long time to turn around. And understanding that love is something that makes sense, that we can understand. And once you understand it, you can shape it. You can deliberately shape it. Um, this dance with the people you love. Uh, it doesn't just have to happen to you. Somehow that people's, you know, people are taking a long time to go, oh, really? Really? Um, you know, that's a whole different way from for thousands of years in civilized society, we've decided that romantic love is just a frill or it's just a mystery and it just happens and it, you know, you fall in, you fall out. So it's a big shift to say, no, you can have a science of love. You can understand people's emotions. You can understand people's longings and fears. There's only so many. There's only so many ways of dancing with someone. Love is a dance. We come close. The problem in relationships isn't conflict. Everybody fights. The problem in relationships isn't that people are different. Everybody's basically incompatible, right? <laughs> I've been married to my husband for 30 years. His favorite thing to do is go straight up enormous mountains and hills. I don't like it. It hurts my legs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like heights, right? Don't like it. So that was one of the first big fights we have. You know, I mean, he's so I like to dance tango, Argentine tango. He hates it. So everybody's different. Everybody fights. What we've understood, speaking in language that really fits for us right now, is that conflict in a relationship is the inflammation, the virus, is emotional disconnection, and a no place where we can get our deep, wired in longing for emotional connection met. We don't know how to talk about that. We don't know how to accept it and own it. We don't know how to talk to each other in a way that helps our partner come close so that we can hold each other tight. That's, that's the issue. So we've, we've understood so much in the last 20 years and, and people need to know about it. I think, I, am talking to you. <laughs> I think that the biggest bit in the book which shocked me was when you talked about how, I mean, what's a common thing for couples to say, oh, it's a communication problem, it's a negotiation problem. You say in the book, Look, I mean, we've done the studies. John Gottman has done the studies. There's really no correlation between couples that communicate effectively in the health of their relationship. This blew my mind. Well, no, what? Yeah, yeah, I hear you understood. It blew my mind too. What they're saying is a bit more specific than that because we haven't known how to help couples because we haven't understood love relationships, right? And so we've treated couple relationships like it's a deal. It's a contract, it's a deal. It's not a contract or a deal, it's an emotional bond. But we've treated it like that. So therefore we've said to ourselves, okay, so if it's a deal and you, people make, gotta make rational deals and collaborate with each other, right? And make fair deals, then teach them communication skills. Teach them um, you know, how to negotiate. Teach them how to problem solve together. Teach them active listening. So and it's still happening all over the world. All this energy going into teaching people in institutions, not just therapists, that you know, the American army for a while was doing this. Now they're using our program a lot. The Canadian army, you know, big institutions, teach people these communication skills. The issue is it's on the wrong level. It's sort of in the cognitive level, right? And you can learn them, you can, you can learn the communication skills. It's a certain kind of dance. Issue is, when you lose your emotional balance with the most important person in the world to you, <laughs> and when your brain is flooded with danger cues, like, 
oh my God, I'm going to be rejected and abandoned here. I could lose this relationship. Maybe I don't matter to this person. Your whole nervous system is zinging with danger. You don't give a damn about the little set of communication skills that are sitting here. It just doesn't work. What works is for you to be able to go in and get your emotional balance and accept your vulnerabilities and your needs and, and see your partner and see that your partner's vulnerabilities and needs. And it works for you to have powerful experiences of being able to change level and reach for each other. Those experiences are uh, they're, they're survival experiences. Your brain knows that these, these events matter and your brain holds on to them. We watch movies. We remember scenes from movies where people are bonding. We remember scenes from movies where people are vulnerable and where they find other people to hold them. Why do we remember those movies? Because our whole nervous system says, that matters that matters that safe haven secure base for us that matters we need that kind of interaction like we need oxygen right and so you give people these kinds of experiences changes how they deal with their emotions how they deal with their basic longings and their needs changes their safety their basic safety with their partner changes how they dance in these moments of vulnerability. You could say that's a skill on one level, but it, it's, it's kind of, it's not, it's more like you have to have the experience. You know, most of us get married, fall in love and get married and we're sort of intoxicated, you know, and the sexuality allows us to come together and bond and feel that closeness, it's physical. But most of us, have never even seen what I call a hold me tight conversation, which is when people can really share their vulnerabilities and ask for what they need, accept their needs and ask for what they need, they need from each other. You know, say things like, I've always been scared. I don't know why you married me. I've always felt like you were so beautiful and so special and deep inside, I'm always scared that you, you really were in love with my best friend who is so handsome and every day I'm, I find I'm unsure and I'm so scared that you don't really want me. And so I'm anxious all the time and I push you for sex and I, I push you for responses and I end up pushing you away. And it's because there's a part of me that's always scared that I'm not good enough for you. And somebody can turn and say that, they open a door they, they have to accept their feelings. Their partner sees them. Their partner comes and holds them. When you have those kinds of hold me tight conversations, you don't need uh, to learn, you know, a difficult skill set of active listening, which is kind of a formula. Um, you can dance together. You can change level when you need to and, and find each other at that deep, intimate level. That's the basis of a secure bond. And secure a secure bonding with at least one person on this planet it correlates with every single measure of mental health that you could that psychologists have ever come up with securely bonded people are more assertive they're more sure of themselves they like themselves more they're more compassionate to others they're better at dealing with ambiguity and stress they're more resilient they're less likely to get PTSD when they're traumatized. On and on and on. They're better at reading the cues on people's faces. But most of us, I can say all this, but most of us get married and we've never even seen a hold me tight conversation. We've never even seen two adults bond like this. I think I saw it in the pub. <laughs> okay. I think that's how I tuned into all this because there was a lot of emotion in the pub. You know, people would lose someone, you know, and they'd come in and they'd pretend they were fine. And then suddenly they'd weep and all the people in the pub would come by. The men would stand behind and smack the guy on the back. You know, the women would come and give him a hanky. Somebody would hold his hand, you know. So I saw this as a child a lot 
but most of us get married. We've never seen adults do this. We don't even know it's possible, most of us. So, so when we do our Hold Me Tight um, educational groups and, you, and in our Hold Me Tight online uh, program, you see people doing this. You know, and it's, it's very intoxicating to work with couples. You know, um, I give you an example. I don't know whether my answers are too long. You're not stopping me, so I'm just- It's because I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm hanging on every word. <laughs> oh, okay. So I give you an example. So this man says, this is classic because we've taught men to solve problems and to mm. stay in their head, right? So this man says, well, you know, she's angry at me all the time these days and I don't know what to do. And she tells me I don't talk to her and I try and talk to her. And when we're in this kind of dance that you're talking about, um, I just go still inside because I just feel like um, I don't know what to say to her and she's going to be disappointed in me. And so I turn away and I leave because I say anything I say will make it worse. And I don't know what to do here. And so I leave. I say, uh huh. And have you ever seen anybody or could you even imagine? Or have you ever tried imagining turning to her and saying, this is so difficult for me because I, I can't bear to hear that you're disappointed in me and I don't know what to do now. And he looked at me and he said, uh, no, I've never seen anybody do that. Uh, that's crazy. I'm not doing that because if I do that, then she'll know I'm an idiot and, and all his fears. She'll know I'm an idiot. She'll know that da, 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 she won't want me, all his fears. I say, okay, so trust me, I want you to try it. But I notice the way he does it matters. He has to do it slowly. If you want to have emotion work for us, you have to slow it down. Emotion is fast and it overwhelms people. So we slow it down. So listen to my voice, right? I say, so I want you to turn to your partner. I want you to turn to your partner. And can you tell your partner what we've been talking about? Can you tell your partner? It hurts me when I, I feel that you're so disappointed in me. I don't know what to do. It confuses me. And so I do turn away. I do. Because what am I going to do? Turn to you and say, I can't bear that you're so disappointed in me and I don't know what to do about it. I don't know what to say to you to make it better. And he does it. And he does it like that. Okay, because I've, I've shown him how to do it. And that, if you slow the emotion down, we can cope with it, we can take in the message. And she looks at him, bursts into tears and reaches for him and holds him. And he looks, and he looks at me and says, what happened? <laughs> so, but you know what happened I don't have to explain that story to you in long abstract words you know what happened he showed up emotionally he, he became vulnerable he told her underneath my distancing and what looks like my indifference and my control I'm scared of your disapproval because you matter to me that's what he told her and it, it just evokes this emotional response in her she responds and she says which is classic because we've taught women to focus on relationships and check relationships out and depend on them and we've taught men to shut down their emotions and look like they're self-sufficient all the time the tend self and befriend right yes tend tend, we've taught women to tend and befriend so you know um women the woman turns around and says what women often say which is I don't need you to fix everything. I don't need you to fix the problem. I don't need you to problem solve every problem in my life. I don't need you to perform as some super, super, super husband. I just need you to be with me. I want this. I want you. You're the solution for you to open up and be with me is the solution. You know, and she's saying something very profound and it blows his mind. Right, she wants the connection with him. That's why she's getting angry and pushing. You know, the big thing in North America in distressed relationships is one person, usually the woman, but not always, 
realizes that there's no connection, emotional connection in the relationship, feels lonely, feels like they don't matter, feels unsupported. So they push for the connection. The part, other partner doesn't respond. And so it turns into real pushing. It turns into, I'll make you respond to me. Are you there for me? A multi-million dollar question in relationships is, are you there for me? A-R-E. Are you open, accessible, responsive, are engaged with me? Are you there for me? Are you out on the dance floor with me in the emotional music, right? That's the question. The question comes back, maybe or no. So the other person pushes harder. I'll make you respond to me. I want to matter to you. They, they look like they're attacking, blaming, putting you down, being critical, right? Trying to hurt you. The other person distances. So you get one person demanding, protesting the distance. It's not clear they're protesting the distance. Even they sometimes don't know why they're so angry, right? They're pushing. We see them pushing for this connection. The other person says, oh, you know, I failed, I've blown it, I'm being rejected, this person's angry at me, I don't know what to do, I'll just shut down. The more they shut down, the more they shut the other person out. The more they shut the other person out, the more their longing for connection comes up, the lonelier they feel, the more desperate they feel, the more they push. Couples can be stuck in that dance for years with just little moments when they manage to connect with each other. They can be stuck in that dance for years and they don't even, nobody even helps them stand back and look at the dance. So we help couples stand back and see the dance they're caught in. See how it leaves them both alone and frustrated and scared, scared of rejection, scared of being deserted and abandoned. And we, we blame the dance. We say, you know, you guys, you're both just caught in this dance. And they start to be able to see it and they start to be able to create sort of a platform, a safe haven where they can say, hey, we're caught in that thing. We're doing that thing that we do in Sue's office. We don't have to, why do we have to do that? Is this one of these times when you just feel like um, I'm shutting down so you feel like you don't matter to me and you're all by yourself? She says, yes. He says, right, I don't want you to feel that way. Come on, let's go, let's have coffee, right? So that's what we call de-escalation. That's stage one of, of EFT. You have to be able to do that before you can do a hold me tight conversation. Then stage two of EFT, emotionally focused therapy, which is what I do, which is based on all this bonding science, right? Is learning not just to limit the negative conversations that lead you down the rabbit hole of both being alone, but learning how to turn towards each other and have these hold me tight conversations <clears throat> where you can go into your softer emotions and help each other with them and find that closeness, that connection, that sharing of, of fears and vulnerabilities, that sharing of needs, that reassurance, right? That safety that makes, just calms people's nervous system, makes them feel like everything's right with the world, right? Those, they learn how to have those hold me tight conversations by having them, not by me teaching them a whole bunch of skills and then saying, go home and practice. So we show them the conversations. You can see them in the book. You can see them in our programs, right? And, and they learn to have them and they love having them. They're so fulfilling, right? They're, they're longing for connection. This is, it's like taking a starving person and feeding them beautiful food. They remember it, right? And then they can have this closeness. Once they have the ability to move into that closeness when they need it, they don't live there all the time. You know, a relationship goes between, you know, distance and closeness on a continuum. But when they know they can have that closeness, that's the basis for a lifelong bond. And, you know, I'm pretty different from a lot of people out there. It's very fashionable these days, especially in places like New York City, <laughs> to say, oh, you know, um, love's impossible. And, you know, one person can't fulfill all your needs and monogamy is impossible and unnatural. And, you know, uh, monogamy is boring and relationships don't work anyway and 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 I'm I'm standing up and saying excuse me 
excuse me, excuse me, uh, there's, uh, excuse me, that's rubbish, okay, there's, that's just spin stuff, let's talk about science, not spin, okay, no, you're wrong about that, we're bonding mammals, and if we understand love, yeah, it's not a constant, you don't sort of get married and be in bliss and then keep it, can you do that, no, nothing in life is constant, can you fall in love with the same person again and again and again, of course you can, of course you can, <laughs> you know look around you you know people say oh look at the divorce rates don't be ridiculous look at the divorce rates in canada um basically about 35 percent of people um end up walking away from their marriage after usually fighting for it for years and this is in the society that doesn't understand love has no idea what's going on is being told it's impossible and these are people who've never seen a, uh, how to dance together but they still only 35 of them percent of them decide to give up after a while and also people get divorced we forget that people change over a lifetime and if you get married at 25 sometimes you wake up at 40 you're not the same person and the other and you don't know how to adapt your relationship but you know we don't teach people how to have these relationships why don't we teach people we teach kids trigonometry what the hell for why don't we teach people this stuff right so they can have good relationships so you know i stand up at conferences and say things that that seem to i seem to antagonize some folks um, <laughs> you know i i say i don't care you know they can be mad at me if they want you know, um, you know, um, I say things like, um, no, I think bottom line is we're different and we have to respect people's differences. But most of us, you know, are happiest and are, it's more possible for us. We're wired for serial monogamy. You know, we're living for a long time now. You know, we're wired for if we can be with one partner, lots of us long for that. Or, but we're wired for this exclusive closeness and sex is a bonding activity. Sure, it can be recreation if you want it to be that. And when we're young, I think we, we experiment a lot, right? And that's good. I don't think sexual repression is good. Having lots of rules is good. That doesn't work, you know, but, but um, if you look at our nervous system and who we are as bonding mammals, you know, sex is a bonding activity, great sex, the closer you are, all the research from the University of Chicago says that uh, which is the best survey research i've ever seen it's a man called lauman he wrote a book called sex in america he wrote more than one actually um says that people in long-term satisfying relationships have sex most often enjoy it most most satisfied by it find it most thrilling right it's like safe connection means that you it, you can play you can be open and responsive and explore and play in bed and out of bed you can be you can you you can dance together in thousands of different ways if you feel safe and connected with somebody if you resonate with somebody if you're in tune with somebody you're responding to somebody you have better sex so i stand up and say that and for some reason that annoys some people i don't know I've been called a conservative Canadian, which just makes me laugh because if you knew me, I'm not the least conservative. <laughs> and I was told, um, oh, Canadians are naive. I said, really? Well, actually, all the best research, especially on female sexuality these days, is coming out of Canada, don't you know? And as far as being conservative, um, awfully sorry, read your history. You know, Canada had. Canada had gay marriage before most, before most of the rest of the world was even thinking about it. You know, so like, no, no. And then I talk about science and all our results. And, and you know, we've even done a brain scan study for good. I'm a couples, I'm a psychologist with my wonderful colleague from the University of Virginia, Jim Cohn. We did a brain scan study where we looked at, uh, women, uh, men and women in very negative marriages who, who weren't bonded, who said they, were, they weren't just going through a bad patch. They told us they were insecure, they didn't trust each other, they had terribly insecure bonds. 
we took them in and we did sessions of therapy with them. Well, at the beginning, we put the women in an fMRI machine, a brain imaging machine. And we told them, when you see an X, there's a chance you'll be shocked on your feet, right? And the shock's going to hurt, okay? Right. So not very pleasant. Um, so we left them in the machine. And when they were alone in the machine, and when a stranger held their hand, and when their partner held their hand, when we, at the beginning, when they first came into the study, and we showed them the X, their brain went berserk. Their brain went into alarm. And if we shot them, um, they said, oh, that re that's very painful. So then we teach them how to have hold me tight conversations. And their relationship improves. Their bonding improves. They feel close to this person. They can trust this person. Yeah, this person becomes a safety cue for their nervous system. We put them in the machine again, right? When they're alone and when the stranger holds their hand and they see their ex, the ex, their brain goes into alarm, just like it did the first time. But when their partner holds their hand this time, after these bonding events, they see the ex, nothing happens in their brain. Their brain looks like a resting brain. What the hell is that? It's our mammalian brain taking the contact with a loved one and using it as a buffer against stress and danger. It's not that the woman's coping with the danger, the fear better, even her prefrontal cortex, the coping system in her brain is shut down. It's just relaxed. She's actually perceiving the danger differently because she's got this safe haven of this person, this connection with this person. We know this on a left. This is why we now allow men to hold their the wives' hands when the woman's in childbirth. And we know that it helps the woman and it calms her nervous system down and it changes the amount of pain she feels. This is why there's a movement in North America called Nobody Dies Alone. This is why our nurses in the and our our peop, our health professionals in this pandemic that's happening right now get upset when they can't they they go in and they hold people's hands as they're dying this is why we all know that when we're dying we want the people we love around us right this is our bonding brain so we've done a brain scan study so when people get mad at me and say you know you're weird because what we know is that in a long-term relationship we're just going to get familiar with each other and then you can't turn each other on so we're not wired for, for monogamy we need to have polyamory poly what's it poly this poly that we need to have open relationships we need to you know and all this stuff i say sorry that's just your opinion that's just spin that's just journalists making money i let's talk about science let's talk about thousands of studies <laughs> let's talk about our studies where we actually change relationships you know we you know i'm sorry let's talk about all the couples all over the world about 40 countries right now use our education programs our hold me tight education programs let's talk about all the people who take those those education programs and who who filled in questionnaires and who tell us that these programs change the way they are together, help them fall in love again, help them heal wounds. Let's talk about that. <laughs> and then they get mad. <laughs> because it's, what I'm saying isn't fashionable in a lot of circles. It isn't trendy. It isn't, you know, I think it's, I think it's uh, obviously, I'm passionate about what I do. I hope you've picked that up already. I'm sure you have. Uh, you've John, almost I, come through my screen a few times. Yes, so. <laughs> I know. Yes, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> passionate. You know, and when, if we go back to the pub, I mean, my deepest bond was with my dad growing up. He was an amazing man, and I talk about him in, in, in the book, Hold Me Tight. And um, I'm not sure I put it in there, but. I, because I feel, you know, it's not something that I, I, put, I want to put down in print all the time. But um, the bottom line is my, ma my father was an amazing man. He fought in the war. He was a pillar of strength. He was a calm, kind, 
amazingly balanced man. And um, I went to work with the US Army at one point and um, they use our programs now, right? And this general said to me, and it was a fair question, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Canadian psychologist? Why do you want to talk to my men who've just come back off deployment in Iraq about relationships? What do you know about relations? What do you know? And I said, okay, I'm here because I wasn't, I didn't grow up in a military family, I grew up in a naval family, surrounded by men traumatized by war. I'm here because I realized that my father could deal with everything the war threw at him. What he could not deal with, and he never did deal with, was my mother leaving him. That's why I'm here. Wow. And I liked the general a lot. He said, okay, that's a good reason. You better go and talk to my guys. I said, I will. Let me talk to your guys because they go into danger. Our first responders, our soldiers, they particularly need safe haven, our policemen, they particularly need safe haven relationships to go back to. You know, firemen, I work with the firemen of New York after 9-11, you know, these people, sure they need to be able to put their emotions aside when they walk into a fire or into a gunfight, but they can't live in that place where they're shut down and put their emotions aside, they'll fall apart. They, they need to go home and have a hold me tight conversation with a loving partner, you know, whether it's a gay partner or a straight, it doesn't matter, you know, whether, you're, whether your you know, partner of choice is the same sex or the opposite sex, you have to have this bond, you need this bond, right? So, so, um, so I, 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 I know from my experience from our studies, I'm completely convinced of my point of view. So then when other people say, oh, it's not fashionable, or, you know, when young people say to me, um, don't you think that the way to go is to give up on uh, trying to find one person to love and to be polyamorous? I say, no, it isn't the way to go. I mean, try it if you like, you know, we like to experiment. But if you're, if you're asking me if that's, if that's the main road home to satisfaction, I'm going to tell you probably not. It doesn't, it's, that's not the way love is structured. That's not the way our emotional territory is built. You know, we need to know that we come first with somebody. We need to know that we matter and that when we call, there's one person on this planet who will come no matter what, you know, and when we have that person, if we have more than one, that's good. But we have people in a hierarchy. You know, uh, in 9-11, in my practice in Ottawa, I watched what people did. They were watching the TV screens. They were all on their phones calling. Calling who? Their family members. Calling the people who were their safety. They were mostly calling their partners. If they weren't married, they were calling their son or their daughter or, right? Um, and, you know, um, one of my big friends in my life was a Catholic priest. That's when he would close his eyes and talk to his attachment figure. His attachment figure was God, you know? But we all need this in our lives. And this is really what love's about. So at this point in history, we've, we've got a science of love. Please don't let us let it sit on the shelf. Please don't let us turn away into what's trendy or what's the latest spin, what's the latest hum in New York about, you know, relation, you, to have sexual relations, good sex, you need lots of variety, lots of toys, lots of different people. Really? You know, please don't let us minimize these bonds and how important they are. Let's create a re revolution in adult love relationships the way we've created a revolution with the same science, I might add, with our kids. You know, we don't take our kids and drop them off at the hospital for an operation and come back six days later now. Can you imagine we did that in England 
as late as the 1970s, we were doing that. We were doing that. When I was a little girl, I was dropped off at the hospital for five days to have my tonsils and adenoids out. What's interesting is I have no memory of that at all. I know why. I blocked it out. I must have been so numb, so I must have been beyond terrified. I'm dropped off in a strange place with a whole bunch of strangers to go through a medical procedure. This was what my parents accepted. This is what the way we did it. So we got a chance here, just like in this epidemic, we got a chance to recognize the power of our relationships and to pay attention to them and learn about them. We've now got a science of love. I don't want us to miss that chance. I don't want us, I don't want my kids to believe that love is a mystery. You know, I don't want my grandchild to, um, you know, her, uh, me and her, we do finger puppets and it's a bit like me being in the pub. You know, I play out all kinds of people and she plays out all kinds of people. <laughs> right? But, you know, I, I, I want her to know what love's about. I want her to know how to choose a partner, what a, what a good love it dance looks like, what her needs are. I want her to know all that. And um, so, you know, I sit and talk to people uh, on Zoom uh, <laughs> again and again and again because they want to know what I do. So this is what I do. And we have, I have wonderful colleagues all over the world. We have about, 70 centers associated with our is educational institute we educate therapists and counselors all over the world and the people who lead our education groups um you know and we do a lot of social media now you can go on drsuejohnson.com and watch me do little talks you know um i'm a bit of a ham so you know i don't mind doing that you know but um uh, i play you know i like to play i like to talk to people but um, I think we're, we're making a difference. Uh, you know, we teach in Iran, we teach in Egypt, we teach in Russia, we teach in New Zealand, we teach in Finland. People are the same. Human beings' nervous systems are the same. We have the same longings, the same fears, the same emotional needs. So, of course, we have to adapt to these different cultures. But basically, if you have a map to love and a map to people's emotions, you go in, we train all these people to educate, to help people change relationships. You know, couples therapy is now becoming a sort of more normal thing for people to do. Why not? You go get help with your teeth. Yeah. Why don't you go get help with your relationship? What the hell? You know, it impacts your life just as much as your teeth, you know, it's, um, what did I read the other day? It's an old, old study. People still quote it. Oh, emotional isolation is as bad for your health as smoking 15 um, cigarettes a day. Somebody came up with this. I think that's a wild underestimate, personally. Uh, you know, uh, so this stuff is important and and i don't know i you have been so generous with me you haven't you've just let me rab it on you haven't um you know you're i haven't, the, you're the haven't expert given you little, <laughs> neat, little neat answers so joe so well, i hope you this is kind of what you wanted to happen this is honestly i couldn't have asked for anything better i'd love to if you've got some i'd love to just ask you about maybe one or two more things yes, would that be okay um what well one of the conclusions i came to when um, I went through Hold Me Tight, which I want to say, as I said before, I think it's the best book on relationships made, which I but definitely the one I've read, is I came to this conclusion, and I'd love to know if, if you have similar opinions or you can tell me if I'm completely wrong. I'm, I'm, you know, I'd love to know. And it made me think that in terms of affairs, that I think that this is maybe a common perception that perhaps it's... Uh, he makes more money than me or he's more attractive or, uh, you know, they're better looking and all these things. And that's probably the reason as to why affairs happen. But my theory was when I heard it, that was that actually it's probably down to 
you know, these bids which we make and it ends up becoming emotional neglect. And then yeah. we seek it elsewhere. Am I, am I on the right path? Yes. Like, I think the, the story in our society, because we haven't understood love and bonding, is that affairs are all about lust, hmm. you know, or about somehow um, finding someone, as you said, uh, better, you know, making more money or something. Um, but men and women, I mean, I've seen thousands of couples over the years, and I work with therapists who've seen thousands of couples. We've got thousands of couples in our studies. It's pretty universal when you really talk to people about affairs. It's all about feeling starved of what you need in your relationship. It's all about feeling lonely or rejected or abandoned in your relationship. And, you know, you feel like you're failing. You feel like the message you're getting from your partner is you're disappointing. You feel criticized by them. You feel small, incompetent, lost. And, you, and your secretary, who you've worked with for years, <coughs> brings you a coffee. <coughs> when she brings you a coffee, she smiles at you. And you feel important. And you suddenly notice she's very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and you suddenly notice she's got great legs. And the next day you say to her, would you like to go for coffee? And she says, sure. And then you tell your secretary how mean your wife is, <clears throat> you know, and your secretary is comforting and listens to you and you feel like you matter. And suddenly she's the hottest thing you've ever seen. Right. And, and this is how it goes. And, you know, um, people want to be desired. There's where the sexual, they want to be desired. We believe that everybody wants orgasm. Let's be clear here. This is an adult conversation. If what you really want is orgasm, the most effective way is to give yourself one, okay? You don't even need another person, okay? So what I see is men and women, they might express it differently. Men and women want to feel desired. They want this emotional connection in sex. Yes, they want, you know, they want to be turned on, but it goes along with being able to be safe enough to let go and be overwhelmed by the sensation. And you can do that more when you feel safe and connected, right? And men and women want that emotional connection, that bonding experience. And it's when that goes wrong that people have affairs. The other myth out there is that you can't heal affairs. Well, we, we do it. We do it all the time in EFT, in our therapy, um, we talk about it in Hold Me Tight, in our Hold Me Tight education program, in our Hold Me Tight groups. You can heal injuries. You have to understand them. <laughs> you know, you have to understand what they're all about. And you have to understand that, you know, there's only so many ways that work. It's just like everything else. Once you understand the structure of things, there's only so many ways to grow trees. There's only so many ways to fix someone's teeth. You have to understand teeth before, you know, there's only so many ways. If I'm going to forgive you for something that scared the hell out of me and threatened me and made me feel very small and very helpless, if I'm going to forgive you, what we've learned is I have to be able to say my pain so that you really get it. I have to be able to say my truth and my pain to you. And you have to be able to let it in and hear it. And then you have to tell me and show me in your face, not just use words, show me in your face and the way you are with me. You have to send me these messages that my pain hurts you, that you care about my pain, that my pain hurts you, that we're one in this. And you have to apologize out of that place on that emotional level where I get that you care about my pain. When that happens, and that's a very particular kind of hold me tight conversation that's based on healing injuries, we call it attachment injury repair, right? When that happens, yes, you can heal. People come together and bond around that experience and they can forgive each other. But it has to happen on that level. You know, in, hold me, in the book, Hold Me Tight, I talk about all the ways we apologize that don't work. 
you know, like, I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Here's the reasons why I did this. And really it was because you were being so difficult. No, no, that doesn't work. No, well, you know, and so we have a thousand sort of cognitive easy ways to try and, and apologize that don't work. It has to be on an emotional level. And, you know, we've learned to structure these conversations and they have a reliable, predictable emotional impact on inside somebody and in on the way the people dance together so yeah you can heal affairs and um you know if if people know it's possible nine times out of ten they'll fight for their relationship they'll fight for their relationship it's funny we have naive ideas when we're young we like to feel we're in control you know i can remember telling some girlfriend you know um oh well you know, if I ever found out that my partner was cheating on me, that'd be it. You know, I'd say to him, out the door, I'd say, you know, like, you have these, until it, you know, and, and has that ever, oh, in, in, a, in a relationship, in an early relationship, yes, it did happen to me. And actually, I did say, here's the door. <laughs> but, um, but, but, you know, when I think about my husband now, you know, I mean, I can't imagine that would happen, because if you're, dancing close in real synchrony with somebody you can have lots of difficulties and lots of fights but if you're dancing close there really isn't any room for anyone else to come in there mm -hmm. you know and my relationship is so precious to me i wouldn't ever take that option right it would have to change radically for me to take that option but but who knows life is you know supposing my I, my husband did have an affair it's so interesting because I'm no longer in that place that I talked about with my girlfriend. It's like, are you kidding? You better believe I'd fight for my husband. You'd better believe I'd fight for what we've got together. You better believe I'd go to a therapist and I'd find out how to, how to get back our connection because I know the value of it. You know, so, um, so again, people don't know it's possible. They don't know, they hurt. You know, love's double-edged. It's the most glorious thing. It's more important even than the most sentimental bullshit, you know, um, thing that Hallmark cards can put on it and that all that Hollywood can do with it, right? It's, it, it's so important. It's so great. It can grow us, change us, make us feel safe and happy. Right? At the other end of it, of course, it can devastate us. We're never so vulnerable as when we love. So... <clears throat> You know, people get overwhelmed by this hurt and they don't know what to do and they don't want to be hurt anymore and they lose trust and they don't know how to put their relationship back together. So then they, they end up splitting up. But, um, and I'm not saying that all, you know, our job isn't to keep all relationships together. Our job is to help people have good relationships. But, um, you know, if our experience is if you show people how to heal their relationship and that they can do it um nine times out of ten you know people will fight and they'll fight for that bond that's we have this longing we need to belong and the more we belong the bigger we can become the safer we become the bigger life becomes so yeah we fight for our relationship I, love it. I had another one. You had another question. Yes, my next question would be: um, so at the end of every episode, I always ask, based on you know your life, your work, could you give us and our audience a challenge that we could implement into our relationships today? <laughs> oh, all right then. Well. Um... I'm trying to think of something that you could find the answer to if you found it hard, if you could go and read the book and find the answer, because that only seems fair. I don't want to challenge and leave people hanging. Um, okay, so what I challenge you to do is to think about the, the moments in your relationship when you feel most vulnerable. And I challenge you to close your eyes for a few minutes and think about those moments and then imagine 
And if you can do it after you've imagined, that's great. But maybe it's enough just to imagine. Imagine if you just stayed with that vulnerability, if you didn't change it or fudge it or cover it up or disguise it or turn it into a blame of another person. If you stay with that vulnerability, imagine you turning and telling your partner, this is when I get scared. This is what it feels like in my body. This is when I get scared with you. Loving is about being vulnerable. This is when I get scared. And if you are gonna help me with this feeling right here and now, what you do is, imagine it, just imagine it. Because if you have an image of it and you know it's possible, then it becomes an option for you maybe when you're caught in that situation, right? So I invite you to imagine it. That's a bonding scenario. Wow. Uh, and, and lots of people have a very hard time doing it. Lots of people, when they get scared, they hold it inside. They're ashamed of it. They feel that it's weak. They don't think they should feel that way. They don't think their partner will hear it. They don't know what to do with it. And so they're stuck and they're kind of walled inside into their own anxiety and their partner doesn't see it. So no, their partner doesn't respond to it. You know, I had a lady say to me yesterday, ah, she said, well, um, if there's a good match, if somebody's a soulmate, whoever came up with the idea of soulmate should be boiled in oil in a public square somewhere. Okay. But, um, so if, if somebody's a soulmate, um, you shouldn't have to tell them what you need. They should just know. And she said, don't you agree with that? I said, no, I think that's one of the most pernicious, dumb ideas that our society's ever come up with. <laughs> so I said, no, awfully sorry. You can have the most lovely, kind, open, warm, an engaged, present, responsive partner in the world, they're gonna get your signals wrong. They're not always gonna be able to tune into you. They're gonna be distracted. They're gonna, they're gonna have their own take on things. They're gonna miss your cues. If you want your needs met in a relationship, you gotta find them, accept them, and speak them in a way that your partner can hear. Otherwise, not going to work. And she roared with laughter and she said, Oh, she said, well, um, I've never done that. <laughs> and I said, right, right. You know, um, but that, that's what we have to be able to do. So that little exercise is just a little playing with that, just playing with that. And, you know, doing it in your head, imagining it, being able to just sit with that vulnerability and make it into a simple, clear little message. I feel this, this is what my body feels. This is when I feel it. This is, it feels bad, I don't like it. Um, and this is what happens to me. And I say to myself, I'm not really important to him. I'm not really important to her. What, and then, and imagine you turning and saying, at these moments, See how specific it is. It's not a great big statement. At these moments, this is what happens to me. This is what comes up for me. This hurts. This is difficult. And what I want to be able to tell you is, this is what I say to myself. And I'd like you to help me with that feeling. And the way you'd help me is you just turn and take me in your arms and say, you're my precious one. You're my special one. Imagine that. And think about that. And if you can do it, and if you're doing it every day, or not every day, if you're doing it regularly in your relationship, good for you. And if it seems strange and foreign and weird, I invite you to think about it. I invite you to go and get some crazy book called Hold Me Tight and watch, and watch how couples do it. Right? I, I, I love it. So what books have impacted your life? Oh, John Bowlby, all John Bowlby's books. Um, um, Really, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a prof I'm a professor and an ap academic and a researcher. So you know, I tell you terribly boring books on adult attachment. And <laughs> but you know, um, I read novels like I consume novels. I consume history 
I just read an amazing book on the first year of the World War II, Winston Churchill, called The Splendid and the Vile. I love history. I love reading about people's lives. And that was talking about Churchill and how quirky he was. And you know what? Lots of fascinating things. But one of the things that fascinates me about Churchill, he has an amazing emotional range. He's an Englishman. He was in the military. He was a leader. He was taken when he was, he had a very unresponsive, cruel mother, very rejecting father. He wasn't close to anyone. He was taken and put in boarding school when he was a child. This is torture. Talk about how to systematically distort someone's personality, okay? Doesn't fit with who we are at all. And yet, you know, um, he grew up into this amazingly complex human being. And the thing about Churchill was he could stand up and get enraged and turn that rage into resolve. You know, we will fight on the beaches. We will never surrender, right? He was clear. He could make decisions. He was amazingly creative. And he would regularly burst into tears. And that's why the people of England loved him. He would walk around in the Blitz bursting you know he after the blitz he'd walk around London he'd burst into tears he'd cry at funerals he showed himself to people you know he was a huge human being and at the same time you know he he drank all day you know he didn't start um the beginning of the day with a cup of tea he started it with a scotch right? <laughs> <laughs> in the movie there's a movie about him and one of the movies is the king says to him um, however do you drink so much? However do you manage to drink so much and still say, you know, the way you are during the day? And Churchill says, practice. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, he's an amazing man. He was totally bonded with his wife. And, and yet they, they slept in separate bedrooms. They were kind of upper class English, right? But he adored her, right? And... Um, he was, I don't know he was a terribly good father. Uh, he was a bit busy, you know, with trying to change the world and keep the world safe. And that, that doesn't really go together with being an incredibly engaged dad. But so I love history. Um, or I read books that you would think very boring on books on research on emotion and on bonding and on relationships. Um, but I think if I had another life, I would be a historian and wow. I love the stories of human beings in the past and what we could learn from the past and how we don't often learn from the past. You know, this, this present epidemic, everyone's talking about, what are we going to learn from it? My fear is that we'll do what we usually do with unpleasant, scary things, which is the minute they're finished, we, we run away from them as fast as possible and forget them as quickly as possible. That would be a shame mm -hmm. because we've learned what attachment science has said to us all these years, I think, in this epidemic, which is we're not only better together, we better get together. We need to be together if the world's going to survive, if we're going to survive, and that isolation it's it's ironic because we're all doing social social distancing but we also i think we've done things like you know in italy the people would all stand out on their balconies and sing to each other for god's sake i mean beautiful 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 you know emotionally you know well, i've got a, a heart in my window for the mental health for the health professionals you know taking risks and so there's this emotional feeling of togetherness. We need to learn from that. We need to, there's so many lessons to learn from this. So um, I hope we do that. I mean, I think history has lots of lessons for us and we don't listen mostly. You know, I, I wrote another book for the public, not just told me to, I wrote a book called Love Sense, uh, which is a bit more sort of researchy than Hold Me Tight. And in the last chapter of Love Sense, I talk about how attachment science is not just a guide for our inner world and our love relationships it's a guide for the kind of society we need to create what human civilization could really be which is a, a loving compassionate safe society where we recognize 
um, people's humanness and our vulnerabilities and our strengths and we build a society like we could do it we have the resources but <laughs> there's a few things that seem to get in the way so uh you know um so i read a lot of history i read a lot of novels because um there i read a book recently called educated which has been on the top of the bestseller list a young woman growing up in a mormon family a very extreme mormon family and how her education expanded her world and got her out of a very cruel, narrow world. Um, I read books about women. I'm a feminist. I think the greatest un unrecognized resource on this planet is the power and creativity of half the human race called women. Um, so I read books on that. Um, but, you know, I'm still obsessed with relationships, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Sue, this has been phenomenal. Can you, do you have any part in messages for our audience and where can they connect with you further? Oh, well, um, they can go to my website. I've just done a new one. Hope they like it. Um, DrSueJohnson.com. Um, I'm all over YouTube. I can't believe somebody made me a list of the of YouTubes with me the other day. I said, I don't remember half of these I, anyway um, i'm all over youtube and they can go to holdmetightonline.com we've just reduced the price amazingly because we want people to do it especially if the world really needs it in this pandemic um, they can go to our official professional site which is icef ice eft emotionally focused therapy iceeft.com that's our official site where we train mental health professionals and counselors all over the world we have trainers who go all over the world centers all over the world if you want if you're a, a professional and you want to learn about our training and how to help couples and families and individuals with depression anxiety or trauma you can go there and see all the training events we offer to professionals see our hold me tight educational groups that happen all over the place in all the cities They've just all gone online, of course, because you can't, you're not allowed to get people together. So I think every month in San Francisco, there's a huge hold me tight group that would happen for couples and they can't do it. So they've just started to put it on online, which has been a nightmare, I must say. But, um, you know, I'm doing therapy online now. Uh, for years, I only saw couples. And now uh, we're also starting to, um, do a study on what we've always done which we saw, we've always worked with individuals as well as couples so now i'm only seeing individuals um so you know we want to contribute to the field of psychotherapy we want to contribute to the mental health field um but i'm also into just educating i'm the educator in the end educating people about relationships educating people about the science of love so I invite you to just go out there and look for me, look for my colleagues, look for if you're a professional, look for an EFT center in your community. If you live in a big city, you've got one. Um, you know, uh, if you're in a country like Iran, you know, look for the, the few people in your country who are doing EFT trainings, they're there. They're doing hold me tight groups in Iran. <laughs> <laughs> so you know sometimes i go like really but they are okay they are so um and we do research on everything we do don't believe anything i say believe the science um i don't need to do a spin with you we've got the science so you know if you're into it you can go and look at all the studies we've done on the icef website all the articles all the chapters all the studies they're all listed there okay some of them are difficult to read um our brain scan study by the time we wrote it up for the for the neuroscience journal even i couldn't understand it <laughs> uh, but um there's a lot of stuff out there and we're all singing the same song we're all talking about attachment and bonding adult bonding the new science of love it's been incredible fun to talk to you um joe <laughs> 